Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Arth, and I work with ACPA College Student Educators International, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Welcome to today's online learning event. Before we get started, we wanted to introduce you to the Shindig platform, which we're utilizing as part of a partnership with Shindig. During the presentation, you can join video chats with other people attending the webinar by clicking on their picture as, it, as a way to engage with others during the presentation. Uh, there will be time for question and answers at the end of the session, but if you'd like to ask a question, you can press the question mark slash ask button and type in a text question. In addition to that, you can also press the raise your hand button to be brought up to the stage to ask a video question. The Shindig room will stay open for 30 minutes after the presentation ends for you to engage in video chats with other people attending today's online learning presentation. We'd now like to welcome today's uh, pre presenters to the stage. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Tim, for the introduction and getting us started today. And welcome to everybody. Um, we're really grateful that you've all taken some time out of your day to join us for what should be a really um, exciting, engaging, and at least fun um, webinar. Uh, my name is Matt Venice. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a research manager at Sky Factor. Um, a lot of higher ed still knows us as EBI. And we're presenting our webinar today on a storytelling approach to data visualization. This webinar is sponsored by um, ACPA's Commission for Assessment and Evaluation, um, a really great resource community for folks, um, whether you do assessment, research full-time, part-time, have an interest in it. Um, our organization really works to do a lot in terms of getting resources out there, connecting professionals across the community, um, and just really trying to help support the profession. There's some links and resources at the end of this webinar if you're interested in more about what the Commission for Assessment and Evaluation does and want to learn more and connect and participate in some of our events. Uh, Tim, if you want to go ahead and advance, um, I'm going to pass it over to let our other presenters introduce themselves right now, and we'll go ahead and start with Sherry. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Matt and I are actually in the same room, which is, uh, I think, a little bit unusual. My name is Sherry Woosley. I'm the Senior Director of Analytics and Research here at Sky Factor. Uh, we're one of the Macmillan Learning Companies and excited to talk about data visualizations and storytelling. Kristen, do you want to do? Sure. Um, good. Well, it's, I don't know. Morning, afternoon, depending on your time zone. Morning for me. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Kristen McKinney. Um, I am the director of the Student Affairs Information and Research Office at UCLA, and I'm happy to be with you today. Oh, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Thanks, Kristen. Um, as we go to the next slide, we'll, we have our kind of high level plan for what we're looking to cover with today's webinar. Um, we'll open with a little bit of context in terms of thinking through concepts of data visualization, the importance of that, why that matters, and how it fits into this big picture with storytelling. Um, we'll move on to have Sherry talk a little bit about some storytelling concepts. Kristen will cover some data visualization concepts. The, the presentation itself, it does a nice blend of some conceptual stuff with some real examples to, to get you thinking a little bit differently and think about some ways that you can apply this in your own work. Um, and as Tim mentioned earlier, we'll have an opportunity at the end for um, any questions that you might have. So as we move into the next slide and get us starting here, m most of us have learned over time, and in particular with importance over the past few years, the importance of collecting good assessment data, using it to better understand the experiences of our students and our colleagues on our campuses, to identify areas of improvement, to assess whether or not the improvements, the efforts, the initiatives that we're doing are making a difference. And even more when we're thinking about um, difficulties with resources on campus and justifying the, the resources and efforts of our office, the importance of good assessment data has never been more vital and more prominent in higher education. But there's a lot of problems that come along with this need and this drive for good assessment data. On the next slide, first of all, a lot of our campuses just have too much data. We've gotten into this place where we're just collecting data, doing surveys, focus groups, evaluations, sitting on these mounds of data. We've 
even hearing stories from when I used to be on campus talking about the binders of data we had sitting on shelves, on bookshelves in our offices. There's just a lot of data out there. It's sitting in a lot of different places on campus. And this makes it difficult for us to get it into one place, figure out what's out there and best hone in our efforts. On the next slide, the, another problem with it is that there's a lot of it that quite frankly is ugly. Um, I cracked the joke a second ago about binders. Um, having binders, page after page of data tables with tiny fonts that it's hard to read, or a PowerPoint slide that is just filled with text-heavy um, information about data and findings that are difficult to understand and decipher. Think about a time, perhaps, where you've been in a meeting where folks are sharing results from an assessment project, and it's slide after slide of data, and it's tough to figure out what the story is, what's going on there. I've been there. I've been in those meetings where it's been painful. And I like assessment. I love it more than most people do and maybe you should. <laughs> so for somebody like me who loves assessment to have those moments where you're looking at data and struggling to wrap your brain around it, think about how that experience is for professionals who aren't used to assessment who may not enjoy it, who may be intimidated by statistics, uncomfortable, unfamiliar with assessment data. It creates a real barrier when we're trying to think about the things we're trying to do with that data. On the next slide, it, it's really a shock in contrast to think about comparison to how data typically is shared and presented on our campuses versus looking at how as humans, our brains are hardwired to take in and process and digest information visually. Just a couple quick statistics as an example, about 90% of the information that comes into our brain is visual. About two thirds of, our, of the population is primarily visual learners, and about half of our brain is dedicated to processing visual stimuli. Our brains are hardwired to take in a lot of information visually and be able to make sense of it quickly. So taking the time to think through how we visualize our data, it, it, it's important, it's worthwhile, and it matters when we think about the purpose of our work in collecting assessment data, sharing it across campus to try to make a difference in the student experience. On the next slide, however, while thinking about the, 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 this visual piece of assessment data, putting together good visuals often can be time intensive. A lot of the resources and efforts out there around products like Tableau or other data visualization softwares have some really good resources and tips, but there can be a steep learning curve. It can be time intensive. And most folks really are looking for some easy, simple, practical resources that can help them put together better visuals to help communicate their results and the work they're doing. But it's not just about the quality of the data visual itself. On the next slide, it shows this Venn diagram, this framework that I absolutely love talking about how it's not just the visual piece. And when you think about these concepts of visuals, storytelling, and the quality of the data, they really come together in a way that helps us to do our work better. Because you can have good data if you don't visualize it well, it's going to be difficult for people to process. But you could have fabulous visuals and really solid data. But if the narrative and the story around that isn't there, it's not going to resonate with our audiences, with the folks that we need to share it with on campus. And it's going to make it difficult for us to make a difference. So there's a real power when you think about bringing together quality data, effective visuals, and a strong story that those pulled together create this opportunity for us to positively influence um, efforts and drive change on our campuses. So this is sort of the framework we're gonna talk about today in terms of pulling together concepts of storytelling and data visualization and talk about ways that we can bring those together to improve our work in higher ed and in student affairs. So to get this conversation started, I'm gonna pass it to Sherry to talk about some storytelling elements. He's literally passing it as we move chairs, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to talk about storytelling. And what I want you to do um, to start with is think about your favorite story. Because sometimes if we get out of the world of data, it makes it easier to kind of make this link. So think of your favorite movie, your favorite book, your favorite movie or um, TV episode, whatever it is. And I want you to think about 
um, the story elements and what draws you in? And is it a hero story? Is it one of the new movies right now? Or is it kind of a mission story? Or is it um, a mystery with a twist at the end? Um, think of those kind of stories. And then let's talk about um, those elements and those pieces and how they relate to some of our data stuff. So let's go um, to the next slide and let's do a kind of visual contrast between data sharing and assessment data sharing and storytelling. And I want you to think some about the way that we currently or often talk about data sharing has to do with this research perspective, the training that we all got that's super important to the work that we do. But it's research language, statistical, um, even on the qualitative side, you've got a whole set of terminology and things that we use so it, that it feels very scientific. Um, it's also often about sharing little pieces of data and you know methodology and all of this stuff, all of our research training that actually doesn't serve us necessarily well when you're trying to put together a story and a visualization and prompt change. So contrast that data assessment sharing the way that historically we want to do it as an article or something to true storytelling and how storytelling and those favorite stories that we have are all about engaging the audience in the whole story, not just little pieces of it, but this sort of encapsulated story from start to finish. And if you think about your favorite movie, um, you don't think about it as piece by piece by piece. You think about the trajectory of the plot and, and how it went from here all the way to here. And it's holistic. OK, so think about that contrast as we move through some of these story elements. And the reason that that differentiation is so important is actually the next slide. Our goal with assessment data sharing is action. It's, it, you know, yes, we want to share the data and we want pieces, but the ultimate goal is that people remember it and that they do something. Um, even if it's continuing the actions that they're already doing, they're doing it in a form, informed way. Or if it's changing the actions that they're doing, that's our goal. We want this data to make a difference. Um, I think Matt mentioned binders. We don't want to be the binder on the shelf. We want to be the memory that drives a change in practice. So with that goal in mind, that's where stories become powerful and become a tool for us to use. The other reason I think that Matt alluded to of the importance of stories is you've got to get that right so that it informs the data visualizations you pick and how you flow those together and how you put those together. So let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the power of stories. Um, I mentioned that notion of holistic and that, that trajectory of the plot or the, the theme, but also think about how, how the stories engage listeners. Um, typically, when we do a talk around storytelling, we're in the room and we can all talk about how, you know, um, how many people think of Harry Potter and love it. And you can get that engagement uh, even with each other when you talk about stories. So the story draws you in, it pulls you together, and it sort of creates a shared experience among the people who all hear it. Some other powers of stories have to do with connecting to knowledge that we already have, which is one of the most powerful ways to get things into memory. Um, things that are completely disconnected often don't stay with us. If it connects to knowledge that we have, good, good guys win, um, or I should say heroes win, um, that uh, hard work pays off, all of those kinds of things that we have, those larger truths, um, that connection will help us remember it. I mentioned holistic, shared experiences. The other thing stories do is they hit emotions. Um, if, if it's emotional, then that's another way to kind of hit at people's memories so that they'll remember things. I'm not saying we have to do huge emotional things in our data stories, but even hitting at people's motivation and value for what they're doing can be a, a powerful thing. The other thing I would end with in terms of powerful stories or why stories are powerful, they show us things they don't tell us. They don't tell us that the hero is um, the good guy. They show the hero doing wonderful things. Um, they don't tell us that hard work pays off. They show it paying off. And that showing um, speaks to the audience more. So there's a whole powerful kind of element to stories that we miss if we take a true data sharing perspective. But if we can capture the narrative and figure out what it is, we can use it. 
So let's talk about on the next slide some of the elements of stories that we are or could be using and should be using. There's foundational elements. And by the way, if you're a storytelling writer or a true writer, um, you're going to laugh at how fast I go through storytelling. But we use all of these things. And these are actually things they teach in elementary school. Um, we just sometimes forget to apply them to all of our different worlds. So foundational elements, that's the sort of crux to the whole story. Are you going to create a story around a mission, a quest, a desire? Um, or are you going to have a hook, an inciting incident that plays the story and then kind of holds that narrative together? Um, you also often see a hook in a story that starts off with a powerful element, right, that, that plays it. But we can use data to create that hook if we want to use that. We could also have a major dramatic question. Um, we often go there when we're talking about um, retention or is this uh, is is our program working for all of our various students? That can be our dramatic question. Um, then once you've kind of really thought about your foundational elements, you can use design elements. Any good story has conflict. That's what draws you back into the story as it progresses through. Um, without conflict, it's really kind of dry and dull. Um, those, those lectures sometimes that are dry and dull, they're missing conflict. Um, there's progressive complications, and we can use data to create progressive complications that draw us back into the story. If you think about um, TV shows that run a whole long time, they've got to have progressive complications every episode to draw you back in. There may be a pivotal event that happens, a twist at the end of the story that, that pulls you in. You can also do buildups, setups, and payoffs. Um, where you kind of build data up to something so the audience stays there waiting for the payoff. These are all elements we can use as we put together stories. So let's look at the next slide and talk about a couple more elements just in case you need to be thinking about these as you're putting together your story. There's ways to lead off a story. Um, I actually saw, um, we, we had been doing this kind of uh, presentations for a while about leads. And so question, you know, you lead with a question and then you proceed to answer it. You can lead with an action or some something that's happening, people talking, a quote, that's where you can sort of kind of incorporate pieces, um, a snapshot, a picture. Um, sound effect was one that I saw in my um, my daughter's elementary school class where they said lead with a sound effect. And I, I puzzled a long time over whether we would ever be able to do that for an assessment data storing thing. I actually heard of an example at NASPA this last year. Um, I think it was NASPA, wasn't it? I NASPA it, ACPA. It was ACPA. ACPA, um, where one of our audience members said they used a sound effect, a video game sound effect, to talk about the impact of video games. So it is a possible way to lead and suck everybody into your story. Um, but also think about how you're going to end it. Are you going to end on a high? And maybe you want to do that for particular audiences when you're talking to parents and students about what we're learning about our programs. Um, maybe sometimes you want to end on a down ending to, pr to promote action to make changes. Um, you can also have a false ending, which can be kind of a false start, and then you kind of add it back in. Or you can do uh, an open ending. As a person who comes out of assessment, I often did open endings because I wanted to sort of lay out the data, look at what was happening, and prompt the group to solve problems. So I didn't want to end on a, on a bad note where they'd argue with me. I didn't want to end on a positive note to say things were good. But here's the data. This is what we want to do. Now what do we do? So think about what endings you're using and even which ones you're not using. Um, and think about how you can apply all these different concepts to put that narrative together so that when you get to the part that we're going to hit next with Christian, Kristen about data visuals, you, you're thinking about how that visual can facilitate the story as it moves through rather than little bits and pieces. Create that narrative, you'll have more power. So Kristen, I think it's your turn. On the next slide. Okay. So I believe I've unmuted myself and I forgot to say in the beginning, I am actually going to have to run out after my section um, and not be able to stay around for um, questions because I have, I got called into a meeting with our senior leadership. So, um, but I know that Sherry and Matt can probably handle any of the questions you might have for um, this content. So um, sorry for forgetting to do that earlier. Um, so on the next slide, I just want to review um, some components for you. Um, and really this idea that once you have your storyline, right, you have sort of, you know, this is, these are the things that I want to say. Um, 
then you're really saying, how do I bring my data to bear within that story, right? And and the way that you you do that in the most influential way is to match your chart type to the story elements so that you're really reinforcing the story that you are trying to tell through your presentation or um, you know other medium. And so different chart types tend to be better at highlighting different kinds of stories. Um, I will say there is a lot of overlap across. And so many of these chart types are good for more than one um, for more than one kind of story. Um, what you see here is some of the most common points you might want to make in terms of um, story points and then the potential charts that you might use. Um, the ones that are bolded, though they're, it's not heavily bolded, are the ones I prefer to use in my own work, but I will say that everyone has their own preferences and styles, and so um, don't feel limited, but just really think about what, you know, what do the elements of that chart type either highlight or, um, or not, and, and how does that help or not help your story um, as you think about those things. So um, we definitely don't have enough time for me to go into all of these different chart types in detail. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of go through um, each of the different story elements, um, point out a few aspects of why you might wanna pick something over another, um, and then go through a few examples just to show you some of that in practice, um, you know, but definitely, um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of resources and books that go into much more depth on how to do these, um, these things if you're interested. So looking at comparison, um, I would say this is probably the most common story element that we use um, in the higher ed context. And, you know, um, uh, because we often are looking at, for example, comparing different outcomes for different groups or improvement between two time points, something, you know, really saying here's this thing and then the other. Um, and for comparison, you really want to select visuals that clearly highlight that comparison, right? That put the values in proximity to each other um, and are easy to read in that context. So um, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit later that visual perception research suggests that we can most easily perceive comparisons along a signal, excuse me, a single dimension such as height or width. And so that's why options such as bars and lollipop charts, um, because they have a really strong linear focus, are really good options for um, making a comparison point. Um, if you though, if you have limited space or you want to make a very specific numerical comparison, then a data table may actually be a um, a better option for something like that because it can be um, be more um, constrained. Looking at aspects of change and how you might want to highlight change, um, change over time. Um, the most common um, and easy to comprehend option is the basic line graph, um, which all of us, I suspect, are familiar with. Um, then vertical bars and stacked area charts are visually very similar in terms of the way that they vary over time, but they use space and color differently with more of the area being filled in. Um, this makes them not so great for stories where you want to show change from multiple items in one chart um, because of the overlap that if you have all the color filled in, um, then it then they can um, lay on top of each other and not be very visually compelling. Um, though that can even be true with um, a basic line graph if the values are very similar for both of the things that you're looking at. So those are things to think of um, as you're thinking about the best visuals for a story of change. Um, the dot or dumbbell um, or slope graphs are options for change, basically for the most part showing change over two time points like a pre-post comparison. Um, and that's why you also see them um, represented in that comparison column. Um, so for ranking, um, this is really just a more specific type of comparison where your focus is really on rank order. Um, so you wanna select a visual that, re that reinforces both the side-by-side -side and the high-to-low flow, right? Or, um, you know, low to high, something like that. So again, options with a strong linear focus, such as bars or lollipops, are great options here because they really help to um, reinforce that um, stepping up or stepping down in terms of, of ranking elements. For distribution, um, a distribution story is generally a story about pattern rather than specific numbers. And so um, it can be a representation of a single pattern of response options or more commonly combined with a comparison element where you're comparing several patterns of responses. 
I myself really like stacked bars for this purpose, especially when you have comparison um, because they can be arranged very closely to each other. One that's gaining in popularity, which we don't actually have represented in this presentation is um, the concept of the diverging bar. And that's where horizontal bars are anchored at a kind of a conceptual midpoint with the good and bad or high and low responses arrayed on each side of that. And it really helps um, to reinforce differences potentially in um, the percentage of, of people who fall into a particular category, say like agree and disagree um, across multiple items. And so that is another um, way of representing distribution um, in, in, in charts. Um, finally, part to whole, um, when you want to tell a story about the contribution that something makes to a whole. So for example, how large or small a particular group represent representation is in the whole, um, you want to pick a visual that does a good job of re representing the whole, right? And so then you can see some part of it. Um, so again, I prefer stacked bars here um, in comparison to pies and donuts um, because this, I think they get less visually overwhelming when you have multiple slices. Um, the general recommendation is not to have more than about three to five slices in a pie. Uh, whereas with um, stacked bars, you, you sometimes can have a little bit more than that without it um, feeling as visually overwhelming. So let's look at some examples. On the next slide, um, this is an example of both comparison and change, or lack thereof for, um, for this one. So here, the primary comparison um, on this chart is between UCLA and the overall UC average. So UCLA is blue, the UC average is in, in the gold. Um, and then secondarily is the time element. And basically what this is showing for us, this, the storyline is stability over time rather than change. Um, if you wanted to, in the next slide, in, as a contrast, if we wanted to say something more about a differential pattern of change and then the time element becomes the primary focus, a grouping something like what's being displayed here, um, you know, really changes that where the primary focus of this visual is actually on, on the, the time series and then the secondary element is um, the, the comparison between the differential change, for example. Um, so moving along to another example in the next slide, um, this is an example of ranking. And here you can see how that clear linear element makes those differences very clear. And now, granted, for some of the top ones here, there isn't a huge amount of difference, but um, you can see that they do get progressively smaller. Um, here I will point out we chose horizontal model bars um, to accommodate the lengthy labels. And so that's something to think about in terms of picking a horizontal versus a vertical bar orientation um, when you are using bar charts. So in the next slide, uh, if we can talk a little bit about part to whole. So in this um, bar chart, I, this is what I would say is not a great example of how to use, how to represent part to whole. Um, in this bar chart, you can see the differences in the percentages of students that, um, that report each response option. But this takes up a lot of space and isn't very visually compelling, right? So, it, you know, you are, here's the part to whole or even like a distribution, um, but it doesn't really tell a strong story. In this next slide, though, if we do something more like a stacked bar, it better tells the story of how the pieces fit together. Um, you will note in this in this bar, I did um, make some strategic use of color um, where I grouped all of the agreement categories into some shade of blue and then all the disagreement categories into more of a um, sort of orange tone um, kind of, you know, to really highlight the difference between, um, in some ways this is similar to what happens in that um, diverging bar, you know, that you're creating sort of an anchor point to show um, the, the difference between those values. Um, a limitation of, of a stacked bar um, for sure is um, that it makes it difficult to determine the, the value of each segment. Um, but in this story, in this situation, really the, the focus of the story is about the pattern rather than the specific values. And so that is also something to think about in terms of selecting your visuals as if, as if the specific values are less important. Um, here I've just said, okay, that full blue 
adds up to 84% because that's really the, you know, I want to say for the most part, our students agree that that students are respected regardless of their economic and social class, right? That that allows me to do that and is more visually compelling than just arraying each of those um, out side by side. Um, so in the next slide, I, we've got a part to whole comparison. Um, and you can see how then layering some of these story elements together, um, you know, here it's very clear to see that there is a, a differential perception um, of respect by different groups. And, and this uh, stacked bar with the different color elements really good, um, allows you to see that very clearly. So thinking about how you use that, and we'll, we'll talk more about um, using color and um, other things to highlight um, your um, your visuals as we as we go forward. So, um, in the next slide, there is another example. This is a, again a part to whole. Um, this donut. It's it's very nice when you're representing a limited split of values. Here you basically have just two slices. You're representing um, basically one percentage, um, but it's very visually compelling as to what you know, what percentage of that total, um, the thing that you are representing makes up, uh, makes up. So they, they do have, they are very nice for um, some very basic splits and, and values. So um, a final example, uh, before we get into talking about um, other chart elements is, um, this is a basic classic line graph. Um, I think there's there's no better way to show change over time in terms of um, how you are representing. But as I said, you could also make this, um, you know, a shaded area where all the area underneath that line is um, shaded in if you want to add more color or um, additional visual elements to, um, to add impact to the story that you are um, representing. So once you have your basic chart type selected, so you're like, okay, this is my story. These are the kinds of things I want to get across to, um, to people. Um, then what you want to do, and as we'll talk about in the next slides, you want to then refine um, the chart that you selected to make that point um, to, to emphasize really specific things in terms of the story that you're telling. So how do we do that? Um, in, in the next slide, um, we're going to talk about um, eliminating distraction by reducing non-data ink. And so what does that mean? That basically is, um, if you think about, say, an inkjet printer, I know some of us still use those, um, and how much you have to pay for those ink cartridges, the idea is that you you don't want to waste your ink on stuff that's not really important to you, right? Um, you want to use that ink in the best way possible and not waste it on extraneous things. So in the next slide, we'll talk about what do we mean by extraneous things, right? What, what do you not want to um, waste your ink on? Um, things like grid lines, um, if you need grid lines, making them very um, light, you know, so that they're visible, but not, you know, hugely dark. Um, decimal points on numbers generally. Um, for most presentations, you probably, unless you have some need to get that granular, um, having any kind of decimal on your number is probably not necessary. Um, you know, and and so you really want um, the most of your ink to be used on those um, on the on the things, the data elements that you're really trying to use to tell your story, and then anything that you need to include that helps with interpretation, but is not specific to your data, you want to make that as light and fine as possible so that allows people to be able to interpret, but isn't taking the focus away from the, um, the major points that you're trying to make. Um, some ways you can also reduce ink are removing your legend and, um, and labeling things directly. Um, as well as, um, you know, making your background a light color and that kind of stuff. So if we're looking at this, like this next slide here that, that we're looking at and, and how we might think about, this is potentially a basic visual you might get from Excel, right? And um, there's a lot of things that you can do in, in this um, to remove remove ink. Um, one of the most obvious would be the dark background, right? You don't need that. It, it's 
potentially distracting. Um, it also, from a um, accessibility perspective, potentially makes um, makes the contrast between things uh, harder to look at. Um, other things, the decimal points, um, the very long labels and redundant text in the legend. Um, and so there's, a, and I'm sure you could come up with some additional things in terms of just looking at this, like where um, there are extraneous kinds of um, components that uh, that could be removed. So if we look at the next slide, this is an example of where I've started paring down. Um, there are definitely some, still some things here that that could um, be additional elements that we could remove, but. Um, we remove the grid lines because the values are labeled directly. Um, and from that, that standpoint, you could also remove the decimals from those value labels. They probably don't need to be there. Um, we've used a lighter font for the axis and could probably move, remove it actually altogether because the values are labeled. And so you don't need the axis to be able to, you know, read across to or put a line across to be able to try to determine the values. The values are given to you. So in fact, you don't need the axis at all. Um, and we've removed the legend and directly labeled each of the bars um, to be able to tell you um, what they're representing. And so that has really reduced the non-data ink in this, um, in this visual. So in the next slide, moving on to um, thinking about emphasis and how how do we emphasize things that are important to us? And so I'll get a little bit into some conceptual information here and talk a little bit about pre-attentive processing. And pre-attentive processing is basically the idea that we unconsciously seek patterns in our world and that our brains are operating at a level that we don't even realize um, that they're doing to, um, like when we, when we see visual stimuli and our eye process, takes that to our brain, that our brain is actually um, operating that on that in, um, in ways that we are not conscious of. And that we act, in fact, as humans do this in common ways, um, you know, that, um, and, you know, that we try to find patterns because that helps us survive um, in some ways that we look for um, patterns of similarity and difference. How do, you know, um, if things are are next to each other, we assume that they belong together, those kinds of things. And so we can capitalize on these what are called gestalt principles um, in design and, and basically capitalize on that human nature and the kinds of things that our brain are, brains are doing unconsciously to um, help reinforce things in our design. So what do some of those things look like? Those are summarized in this next slide. Um, is and, and really like some of these things are, you'll be like, oh, of course I do this already. And, you know, when I'm, you know, like the idea that your, you know, your chapter headings are bigger and bolder, like, because they're um, trying to draw your attention to their, um, so we do a lot of these things, I think sort of unconsciously, we just know they work, right? But the idea being bigger, brighter, bolder, and more distinct is drawing attention, right? There's that you're saying there is something different about this that I want you to pay attention to. Um, and so, you want to do those things if distinguishing something is your intention and part of your story, but you don't want to unintentionally do them. So um, you don't want to have, for example, um, color differentiation if in fact that is not part of your story because what people will do, they'll be like, okay, those are two different colors. What does that mean? And if it actually doesn't mean anything, then you are distracting people from your story because you've introduced um, introduced a comparison that is actually not a comparison that you want to be making. Um, so thing, uh, again, also grouping um, can be a way of helping people to um, focus on things you want to focus on um, by enclosing them, for example, into um, in, uh, in say a box or um, connecting them in some way, or just by putting them um, closer together, um, introducing that aspect of proximity or similarity in terms of how you are representing um, things in your chart. So, all right, here's an example to sort of talk through what, um, on the next slide, what we're talking about in terms of similarity and emphasis. Um, so here, um, I uh, in this chart, I did not vary the color of the bars because First of all, they're directly labeled, um, so you don't need the color differentiation um, from the, the aspect of a legend where you're saying each of these is represented by a different color. 
Um, and because the value that's being represented across all of those bars is the same for each group. It, it represents the percent of agreement across all of the different groups. And so um, that is something that is similar, can be represented in the same color. Um, where I used color was to highlight the all, um, which I did as a line that I introduced across rather than, um, you'll, you'll recognize that I did in fact in this particular image, keep the bar for total that could be removed because it's basically the, um, the exact representing the same thing. And so then you can, you know, make this visual potentially smaller or make um, each of the other bars bigger. Um, but I've introduced the color to say, here's where all students lie. And then it makes it very easy to see which groups fall above the, oh, the percentage for all students and which groups fall below the percentage. And so that really then highlights the story that I want to tell, right? Like, um, you know, what groups do we potentially need to be concerned about in terms of um, their perceptions of their respect on campus, for example. And so um, really thinking about how you use the color to say, here's something that I want you to attend to. All right, and here's a final example of use of color to emphasize. So um, I apologize, this is a little bit small. It does come from a, um, a report that we did, but um, basically here, again, I wasn't um, there. You'll notice there, um, there are very few numbers represented on this chart um, because the point we were trying to make was not something specific to um, the particular individual values that were being represented, but more here's a pattern that we wanted folks to attend to. And um, what you see here is basically um, my own campus's numbers were, um, are in yellow and then all of the other UCs are in varying shades of blue because the point that we wanted to make here is that our campus was kind of an outlier um, in most areas as having more students reporting that they had no classes in um, these areas of diversity. Um, this, was, this was data that predated our, um, our instituting of a diversity requirement for our campus. And that was really um, the reason we pulled this data together was to say, look, all of these other campuses already have a diversity requirement. And you're seeing that in fact, the students on those campuses are do appear to be um, engaging with this content um, in, in greater numbers than our than students on our own campus. And that was a story that we wanted to tell to potentially support the instituting of this diversity requirement. So I will turn it back over to Matt now to, um, to take you through some examples. And uh, I will say goodbye and head off to my um, leadership meeting. So thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thanks, Kristen, for that. Um, what I love as we've progressed through this presentation is that we've seen some really great examples while laying out some foundations for thinking about these elements of storytelling that help connect to our emotions and relate to shared common knowledge and combine those with elements and practices and considerations for putting together quality data visuals. As we talked about at the beginning, it, the power is really bringing those together when you can take a set of data that you have insights that you need to share and think about how you can frame together a story using different storytelling elements and then take that story and apply good practices and data visualization to further emphasize it and that bringing all of those together creates this opportunity to drive change on our campuses. So as a final pulling things together, looking at it from a bigger picture, Krista and I did this really cool activity that is reflect the insights of it are reflected here, where we each took a common set of data and went off on our own and put together a story and some example visuals and then came back together to look at what was similar, what was different, which I think is a really cool exercise because it underscores that even with a common set of data that folks are going to catch and see different things, do similarities, that we've laid out some elements of storytelling and data viz today, but there's no absolute right way to do anything. So depending on your perspective, your needs, your context, that you may do some different things. So what we're gonna do here for the last few minutes is walk through the examples that Kristen and I did, point out some examples of the different elements in there, and just to get you thinking about how you can do some things differently depending on your data.
The next slide highlights just a little information about the data, um, just to provide a little bit of context for folks. It was a national data set we pulled from the MapWorks First Year Student Survey, 44 different institutions, 55,000 college students, primarily first years, and combining survey data from the fall semester with outcomes that the institution uploaded later on in terms of academic performance and retention. So just a little context there. The next slide gets into the, the data itself. So if it were in a report or in a way that wasn't visually pretty, this is what it would look like. So questions on what you think your GPA would be this term, how many scheduled classes you've attended, how many courses you're struggling in, distributions of academic performance. And then the next slide gets into distributions along some skill questions. So to what degree students said they were the kind of students who turned in homework, take good notes, study in a place where they can avoid distractions, things like that. One to seven scale, one being the negative end of the scale that they don't at all do that, seven the positive end of the scale being extremely. The final slide looks at some mean scores for those questions and GPA. So comparing um, the for students who either had below a 3.0 GPA later on or above a 3.0, what the mean scores on those questions were in the percentages. So I went through that a little quickly because the data is there, but just to provide a little context of we were given this data and then we went off on our own to put together, look at the data, find a story, and then put together visuals in a way that reflect that story. So moving on, the first example was the work that Kristen did there. Um, and I apologize to Kristen if she looks at this later and I missed a few things in her story. So what Kristen's story focused on was looking at this comparison between what students expected to earn in terms of grades and what they did afterwards. So even though it's a little bit nuanced in terms of the first time shot is expectations from a survey and then the next time shot is the actual GPA performance later on in that semester uploaded by the institution, it is still a longitudinal look. So looking at what students expected they were going to earn for their grades and then what they actually did and using that color to show that how students inaccurately predicted their first term grades that they have higher expectations but their actual performance isn't matching those expectations. So you can see the the that many students, for example, who expected to get really high GPAs, most of them did. You had a, a larger group, though, that did expect to get good grades that ended up getting um, lower grades. And then you see at the bottom that the percentage of students who expected to get low grades, which was almost none, um, was not the case, that you had a larger number of students um, get poor grades who didn't expect it. But again, using the line chart, each end is labeled so you don't have an axis laying that out, some color to distinguish the groups, but not wasting ink on that piece. But starting the story with this sort of um, this foundational piece of trying to figure out, okay, look, there's this sharp contrast, what sort of happened there? As we move to the next slide, Kristen took a comparison and looked at, okay, we see differences in terms of expected versus actual and looking at what led to that. So looking at the fact that students who have higher GPAs were more likely to engage in positive academic behavior study habits. So what Kristen did is took for each of the five survey questions and then did two bars, looking at comparing the students who got a high GPA above a 3.0 to those who didn't, and looking at the mean scores on those questions. Kristen used a positive brighter color blue compared to a darker contrast color gray to distinguish the two groups and note that they're grouped side by side because or top to bottom because the important comparison is comparing the, the two groups themselves, not looking at trends across each individual group. So highlighting in this visual with just a little bit of color, um, a simple mean score showing that students who ultimately got good grades had we're more likely to say that they engaged in behaviors that intuitively we know are reflected in good students. So turning in homework on time, taking notes in class, spending enough time studying, things like that. And again, these are just little examples. We obviously can build much larger stories off of this, but for the sake of time, we just did a couple examples for each one. So as we move on to the next example, number two is the one that I did separately from this. And what's interesting is that 
Kristen and I have some similar elements, but we chose to display them in some different ways. And not that either of those are right or wrong, because when you start to really get into this data visual piece, there is this, there are some preferences that go into it and things work well for others. So there is that piece there, but it also gets you thinking about different ways you can do things. So what I chose to do in terms of showing the, the, the contrast between students' expectations versus what ended up actually happening is to use two stack bar charts next to each other that the individual bars themselves are labeled, but using color to show the contrast. So shades of blue to show the students who expected to get at least a 3.0 and then the 3.0 buckets versus the orange for those lower, that positive negative piece. Blue and orange are also good colors to use together because for folks who have color deficiencies or color blindness, blue and orange are able to be contrasted across groups who tend to have those issues. So it's a safe common color palette to show contrast where you don't have to be as, it, it, it addresses concerns about color deficiency, color blindness, better than, for example, the typical traffic light colors. Green, yellow, red is a very difficult set of colors for folks with particular color deficiencies to be able to distinguish. So as a little tip there, if you're looking to do that, blue and orange is a safe one. But using the distributions and the diverging to show the contrast of look on the left is what they expected, on the right is what ended up happening, and using the text on the right and coloring those pieces to match their respective stories in the stack bar chart and to show that contrast. So look, about nine out of 10 students expected to get at least a 3.0 GPA, but you ended up having one in five earn a GPA below a 2.0. And then framing it really bluntly around a what happened, that you have this dramatic question at the beginning to get us thinking of, okay, there's a real stark contrast. What happened? What led to this? On the next slide, we get into this piece of that Kristen showed as well, that behavior is not matching expectations. So given the story wasn't in every response option on the one to seven scale, we chose to look at the percentage students who responded either six or seven on the seven point scale. So the high end of that, I chose a percentage. We didn't use decimals. I did the axis in a lighter gray color because it's not a main focal point of the visual and the bars are directly labeled. As a personal preference, I like having the axis on there. I've seen cases where you see folks get a little bit deceptive and showing data on charts. So even if I have the actual percentages there, I like having some form of an axis to sort of keep us honest in our visuals, but I do it in gray because it's not the primary emphasis. So I've used some color here to distinguish the, the items that are in blue that are, okay, students generally are doing pretty well there, but then using an orange color to call out some areas where, look, only about half of students are saying that they study in a place to avoid distractions, spend enough time studying to earn good grades, work on projects in advance of the due date, to call out that caution of there's a problem here that students are saying they expect to get really good grades, but at the same time, many of them are saying that they're not engaging in the behaviors that we know are reflective of students who get good grades. So using things like color and the ranking to sort of call out those caution points early on. As a final slide, I did a little bit of a different piece that gets away from a traditional chart to show the percentage of students who at the same time said that they were struggling in multiple courses. Um, the statistic was about 25%. So I did four icons of people and did three in gray. And I did one in red to call out the distribution across the population who said that they were struggling in multiple courses and used the red in the text at the same time to pair with that to help tell that story. So again here, a, a very small example, but thinking through that for a common data set, applying elements like a dramatic question, progressive complications, thinking through chart types that match that to help us to make comparisons, using elements to simplify and reduce the data ink so that you have some white space, it's easier to process what's going on, and strategically using color in a way that helps to draw contrast, point to critical elements of the visual, and to do so in a way that's not overwhelming and are reflective of folks who may have some issues um, in terms of color deficiencies distinguishing different things. So again, just two examples here with a common data set of some ways that highlighting how you can apply these different elements 
thinking of them as tools in your pocket, not that we're going to use every storytelling element every single time, but being more aware of these things that Sherry talked about that came up when we began writing and telling stories in elementary school, but that we lose over time and trying to bring those more to the forefront so that if we have an awareness of those and are paying attention to those, we can do a better job of applying them when the right moment comes up in our assessment work. So as we start to, to wrap this up together, I know a lot of what we focused on today was some conceptual pieces, some theory, and more just introducing these concepts to you, showing you some different examples and getting you thinking about how you could potentially use them in your work. So as we pull it all together, I wanted to leave you with a few sort of food for thought, so to speak. So if there's anything you take away from this presentation, big picture, here's a few things. There's a lot of places you can go. There's a lot of storytelling elements. There's a lot out there on data visual. It, it can be overwhelming if this is new for you, and that's okay. Start small. Think of it as trying one new thing. So if you do bar charts a particular way and you've identified some areas where you can improve, you don't have to do everything at once. Just try working in one or two new things. Maybe it's getting rid of decimals. Maybe it's fading the axis or the grid lines. Maybe it's cleaning up your labels. Start small. Next, keep it simple. More isn't always better. One of the things that was that we demonstrated throughout when talking about some of these data visuals is this idea of simplifying, that doing tons of different things in one visual or one story could still overwhelm your audience. So keep it simple. Understand your audience. This is probably one of the most important pieces that I cannot emphasize enough. Having an understanding of your audience is going to drive most of your choices. If you have an audience that needs a big picture, that is looking to get the snapshot that you need to connect and resonate with, doing a PowerPoint presentation of high-level analysis, pulling in some of these storytelling elements and the visual, it could be a really good way to go. If you have a very technical sub audience that you need to appeal to, doing a high level PowerPoint presentation may not be the best thing for that audience. Maybe you need to pair that presentation with a technical report that has some more data tables if the numbers are important. So having that understanding of what your audience needs is going to drive a lot of your choices. And it's also OK for a particular set of data to do different types of content for different audiences. So you may have a project that you have a presentation for that you show to key stakeholders. You have a technical report that maybe isn't the most visual, but has more of the nitty gritty details, the specific numbers for all of the response options that more technical folks might need. And then maybe you do an infographic or a flyer to more broadly share your results with the community. Those are different things that you can do around one project to appeal to those different audiences. So make sure you're thinking through your audience as you're doing this process because it's going to drive a lot of your choices. And fundamentally, think about your focus. Remember, as you're putting together your story, your visuals around your project, what's the core message you want your audience to get from it? And remember to take a step back and look at things and consider if that message is getting through or not. Because if it's not, then you maybe need to simplify, rethink your approach. So those are some little practical tips to leave you with that you can think about as you're considering applying storytelling elements and foundational data viz elements to the work you're doing. So at this point, this wraps up our presentation. Um, we don't quite have as much time as I'd hoped for questions, but we do have about five minutes. So I would love to hear from Tim if there's questions that folks have um, from the presentation. Perfect, I see one popped up right now that asks about software to generate graphics and charts. What I think is really great is that for, um, I can't speak for Kristen for sure. I know for my charts, we use PowerPoint and Excel. Um, Microsoft Office products, for as much as there's some nuance and frustration with the defaults and things, th in reality, they are, it's software that's on most people's computers and it, it's what you have to work with. So we did um, those in that piece. Um, if you're looking for some tips to improve how you do the visuals in Excel and PowerPoint, 
Um, there's a resource on our resource page at the end. Stephanie Evergreen has a wonderful website with a whole bunch of how to's about how to make really cool charts using nothing but Excel and PowerPoint. So it, it is possible. It just takes a little bit of time to work through some of the nuances and understand that the defaults aren't necessarily the best way to go. Great question. Thank you for asking. The next question is, what are your thoughts on changing the axis on graphs when you're not eating up a lot of space? So not needing the whole zero to 100%, such as when everything's over 80, making the low 50. I think that's a good question. There, there's definitely some debate out there and you get some personal preference in there. My two cents, I, I anchor at zero always. Okay. I, 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 in terms on the low end, I like to anchor at zero. Um, I think if it's a situation where you don't have to go up to 100%, I think that's okay. I think that's why I get to the point where I still always show the axis on the charts and I just fade it off into a gray. So that way you're being honest and upfront with your audience about what that axis is. I think the key too is if you have multiple charts that they all be on the same scale. So whether you go zero to 100 or 50 to 100 or zero to 50, don't have one chart zero to 50 and another one zero to 40 and another one mm -hmm. 10 to, to 20 because that's when people start looking across charts and seeing things that are just the difference in scale, not the difference in yeah. actual data. So, uh, so consistency is key. Yep, absolutely. That's a great point. Thank you. Another question, how do you balance accounting for color blindness and using organizational corporate colors? This is a great question because sometimes our institutions and organizations are well intended and there's some interesting colors to work with. Typically what um, I do is I'll either stick to one color and do a gradient of it where it'll be like a really bold version of the color and then sort of fade out to show a high to a low or do a comparison where I use my one color as the accent color and then do some grayscale for the others and use that to draw contrast. It may not work in every situation, but those are some two quick kind of easy ones that you can go to in those situations. Absolutely. And testing things. Yes, testing. you may not get it right the first time. That's okay, run it by some folks. What book would you recommend for storytelling and visuals? Well, let me look at our reference list because there's so many good ones out there. I mean, we just got a good book on dashboards, but then there's also, um, what's the other? Well, and Wexler does some cool, the big book of dashboards is the one we just got mm -hmm. recently that we love. But what's the slide deck one? I can't remember. Oh, it's, it's Nancy Duart has a, a wonderful book on, um, yeah. it's Slideology, the art and science of creating great presentations. Um, she frames it around, um, data slides, but yeah. it's the, the lessons are applicable across different types of visuals. Um, all those that we just referenced, there's a slide at the end of this that has all those references listed out. And once the assessment commission gets the list of folks who attended, we'll send out a copy of the slides for you all. Cool. Um, yeah. So at that point, I, we're at time, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, there's some information here on the Assessment Commission. I mentioned everybody will get the slides, so you can reach out to us if you have other questions or want to share some ideas and thoughts. But at this point, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Tim to go ahead and wrap things up for us. Thanks everyone for uh, attending today's webinar and a uh, huge thank you to Kristen Sherry Matt for uh, presenting a great session today. Uh, again, the Commission for Assessment Evaluation will uh, get the attendee list from today and be able to distribute the uh, PowerPoint presentation from today. Uh, at this point, we are ending today's webinar. Again, the room will stay open if you'd like to interact with other people. If you have any questions about utilizing the Shindig uh, platform uh, on your campus, which we utilize today, uh, that uh, slide with uh, Tara's information, who's our contact, is there as well. Thank you all very much, and have a great day. Take care. Thanks, Tim. Thanks.